Okay, so we have the operational stuff out of the way? Yes. Awesome. Hi, guys. Good to see you here. And there's a wicked echo from someplace. You'll mute it? Yeah, I can hear myself. That's very disturbing. I mean, I feel sorry for you. You get to hear me, but when I hear myself, <laughs> I really feel badly. Okay. Um, so originally for the... Oh, we still have screen and screen. Do we need that? Yeah, then you'll block out some of the content on the slides. No, I use the whole slide. No, who wants, to, I mean, you can see me. Everybody, can everyone see me? Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, no problem. So you don't need to, yeah, okay. So for the video, we don't need that. Okay. Um, they have it for the title, but after the title, I think we can get rid of it. And uh, and uh, did you ask me about the branding thing there? <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah, okay, never mind. I'm just kidding about that. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, so welcome. So I'd originally prepared this talk about G1, GC, and I've actually done some other, I did some other talks uh, on this tour because I did a NetBeans day uh, where I talked about uh, performance tuning with free tooling and um, so I didn't really know what so much to talk about. And at this point in time, if I don't know what to talk about, I will just b say, screw the slides and let's talk about stuff and have fun. Uh, but um, since I only have 50 minutes, I think the slides make it structured. And uh, so um, I'll just take a vote. Are you guys interested in G1? Or would you like to see something more along the lines of uh, free tooling? for performance? G1? G1? What are we, are we even? To buy one or two votes, okay, yeah, okay, so we'll do, we'll d we can do that, uh, uh, or whatever, so we'll, we'll cover some tooling here, everything like that. So, uh, so since, I mean, garbage collection is uh, surprisingly an important topic, and it's one that, uh, that's going to become especially more important because when we get to Java 9, which is released in two days? Two days? Awesome. Okay. So when we get to Java 9, which is actually released in two days, damn, I need to write a parser really quickly, uh, then um, uh, it's going to become the default collector. And so it's one of these things that um, I, I only know of one person that knows how to tune it. It's not me. It's somebody over. What are they doing? Who's doing that? Okay. Uh, there's, there's, only one other per there's only one person that actually knows how to tune it. I, I'm not sure who he is or, or he might be here, but... Um, so you can you can actually correct me as I'm going through here because he'll go like ah, as he always does. Actually, we worked this summer at JCrete, and we found a very intricate bug in uh, this isn't going to work if they keep doing that. We certainly not with the recording, so I don't know who's doing what. <laughs> yeah, it works through the recording. Okay, so something like that. So, so we actually found a very intricate bug that I've, something that I observed for more than a year in different production systems. But it's this really peculiar situation that it only takes like, it takes like, like if you run the JVM for about a week, that's how long it takes to show up. So as you can understand, it was like really confusing and, and Simone was the one that basically said, you, you know, f he was going, he says, is that normal? I said, yeah. no, how obvious, that's not normal. This should not be happening, right? And so that's, you know, so he was responsible for kicking me in the ass uh, to make it, you know, to for us to sort out what's going on. Okay, so um, the question is uh, how to tune the G1 GC garbage collector. Um, so um, what we do is we set the max heap size um, using the minus MX uh, parameter. Um, yes, that's not a typo, don't worry. And if you don't want to set it, then the JVM will just start with a quarter of physical RAM. Um, and then you can set a pause, this thing called a pause time goal. I don't know what it's good for, but you can set it. Um, and you know, if you don't set it, it's 200 milliseconds. And then basically, um, we have tuned the collector and, and 
and we're done. Any questions? <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, cable. Okay. So, so if only it were that easy, right? Is 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 the question? And is is the thing here, right? So, you know, here's the thing. Um, and as, as of course we haven't got rid of the video, which uh, destroys my content here, which is the most interesting part of this. So, just a second here. Um, uh, there's also something going on. Okay, so we'll just move the content. And how's that? Okay, so here it is. Like I lift you, grab. Uh, was that concept just a little bit too complex, Carl? Yeah, right. So um, that's a joke. You can laugh now if you like. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Maybe it has a little bit of Canadianism or something in it, but, you know, but that's you know, pretty much it. Is, I mean, has anyone here actually seen or built an igloo? Has seen or dealt with snow or anything? Uh, yeah. Torino, you get snow, so you should. Okay, anyways. Different continent, yeah, different thing, yeah, doesn't work. Okay, got that. It works in some, yeah, anyways, never mind. So, you know, so the thing is, like, if only it was this easy, um, you wouldn't do what I've done this year, which is, uh, you know, my uh, partner in crime said, put, up, put in an abstract for a talk for one place, and he said, hey, you know, we've tuned more than 2,000 JVMs, and I said, nah, can't be, that's ridiculous. And then he said, count them, and I counted them and said, you know, I can count to 3,000. So basically, I've tuned G1 on approximately 3,000 JVMs uh, this year already. And we expect that number to grow as it's people switch over and realize that, oh my God, there is uh, something here. So um, so here's the basically you know, some of the t things that I really want to talk about. Um, so I, I mean, we spent some time deep diving into the guts of how the G1 works and everyone at the end of the talk comes out like stunned and dazed and they really haven't figured out how to do anything useful with it. So uh, I'm going to try the so I'm going to try to skim the surface here and and try to stick to some of the tunable bits. Um, so the things you need to know, just remember, you know, we can go much deeper and there's talks that go deeper and you know, his talk goes immensely deep to the point where I, you know, I'm scratching my head when I'm listening to it. Um, but, I, I, but I think the important thing to look at here is that there's a number of data structures we need to look at. Um, there's these things called regions. Um, there's these things called remembered sets. And there's these things called collection sets. And uh, so we've discussed these things, then, you know, we can talk about, you know, we'll get an idea of what's in there. Um, in terms of algorithms, we, um, you know, that work with the data structure, uh, we have the one I have mentioned here, which are allocators, which are your mutation mutators, or your, um, which are fancy words mean application threads. Okay, so we'll use mutator from now on, just so that we can sound clever. And and then we have young gen collections with mixed collections, and this thing called a concurrent mark. So we'll we'll have a small discussion uh, uh, about these things. Okay, so. The G1 GC collector is going to actually reserve heap in a single chunk. Um, so, you know, technically it says what we're going to do is we're going to reserve a contiguous amount of, of heap in, in from C heap, and then we're, we're going to allocate from that reserved amount uh, this thing called uh, Java heap. And so that's our primary data structure. Now, what we're going to do is divide that heap up into a number of equally sized regions, and there's some maths that you can go through later on when you're reading the slides. I won't bother with that. I mean, so that's just mechanics. But the point is, is that the regions are going to be um, either 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, or 32 megabytes in size, depending upon how the maths work, or how you set it, if you want to set it yourself. Okay, so let's talk about the allocators. So the allocators, um, uh, are going to work like this. So first off, so we have all of these regions and we're going to put them into the free list. Yeah. Okay? And then at the beginning, what we're going to say is that, okay, we're going to say, um, allocators, you have so many regions to work in. So we're going to set a limit. And then what happens is that our threads are going to create, you know, new stars and foos and, and whatever terms you want to use for, for data. But you know, to do that, they're going to say, I want to allocate a new foo, go to the free list, grab a region, 
tag it as being an Eden region, because that's our first region we're going to allocate in, our nursery. And then what we're going to do is we're going to complete the allocation. Isn't that wonderful? Excellent. Okay. And then it's just like wash, rinse, repeat until we use up all of our regions, okay? At that point, we're going to start a young generational collection. Now, the young generational collection is a mark sweep, just like what we've been looking at for years on end. So this algorithm, actually, does anyone know when the first garbage collector was written? Close. 1959, 58. Okay, so close, so you know, give him a hand, it's good. Okay, do you know who did it? The list by MacArthur, yeah, MacArthur, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so cool. So, um, so what happens is we're gonna do the mark sweep. So the mark sweep is basically scan for roots, mark all the live objects, and then contrary to popular belief, it's not collect the dead stuff, it's evacuate the live stuff to an empty region, okay? This point is important because this helps determine what the cost models look like. And if you want to tune the collector, the first thing you need to understand is like, what are the costs, what's the cost model look like, okay? And then you can look at what is my collector doing, and if you understand the cost model, you can start tweaking things to, uh, to try to reduce the overall cost of each individual collection, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to evacuate these to a place called, whoops, I got ahead of myself here, to this place called a two space or, or survivor space, okay? So all of the live objects are going to go into survivor space. Now this works because our applications generally follow this thing called the weak generational hypothesis. The weak generational hypothesis says that most of the data we allocate will not be in use within microseconds of us allocating it. Most data doesn't make it out of the CPU alive. Okay? So this is really cool. Um, but it does mean that our collection is probably going to be dominated by object copy costs, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and there's some parameters here that you can look at, and that, you know, that's interesting for understanding what the limits are and stuff like that. But, um, well... You know, we can, we can talk about these things later. Okay, so what does this look like? Okay, so, so we have these things in young generational space. So, so it actually looks like a traditional generational collector, but divided up into many, many, many different memory pools. Okay? Um, it, and it originally, it wasn't built this way, but the weak generational hypothesis gave us so, such a strong optimization that they couldn't ignore it. Um, there's other collectors coming down the pipe that are pure regional, and they're not using the weak generational hypothesis, and uh, they're apparently getting good results with that strategy also. But anyways, we have these things called Eden regions and survivor regions, and they all live in this area which we're going to call young generational space. Um, and I said the collection is um, familiar tracing collection, so calculate the root set, and from the root set, we're going to mark all of the live data and the, then evacuate, like I, like I mentioned before. Um, and there's one problem in all of this, and that's that bit there. And that's a time complexity, algorithmic complexity issue, because um, now we have to understand what, it, what is a GC root. And a GC root is a, something that's known to be alive, right? Or it's a pointer that's outside of the pool that we want to collect, that's pointing to something inside the pool we want to collect. Now, if you want to know the technical terms, and the technical terms is these are internal and external pointers. So technically, we want to find all of the external pointers. So where are the, all the external pointers? Well, if we're collecting young gen, that means our external pointers are in every other single region in heap. And if we have a large heap, that means we have to scan potentially the entire heap space to find these things. And we don't want to do that. That's expensive. So we'll talk about a solution for that uh, a, a little later on. Now, 
the other concept I mentioned before is this thing called a C set. And what we're going to do is we're going to build these collection sets or C sets by basically putting all of the regions that are going to be evacuated into it. Okay? Um, so, for example, if we're doing a young generational collection, that means that all of the young generational regions will actually end up in the collection set. And so this is, again, a mark sweep of young generational uh, collection. Now, um, let's go back and talk about this time complexity thing a little bit, right? So the, s the, the scan for roots is linear to the size of heap. Um, and so we, ha we can make some choices here. So what we have now is a pay me now or pay me later situation. Right? That's what I call it, right? We can either give all of the work to the garbage collector, but of course that's going to come with a very long pause time, or we can give all of the work to the allocators, which means your application is going to crawl along at a glacial pay pace. So the allocators will go very slow. Okay. Or we can probably have some balance between giving the work to the allocators or the uh, uh, or the garbage collector that's going to help both of them. And so what they wanted to do in this case is they wanted to introduce this thing called a remembered set. And what the remembered set is essentially going to do is track all of the external pointers, if you remember what they are, okay? Now, as so, so what happens is that if I have a foo over here and a bar over there, and I want to collect all of that stuff over there, then that's an external pointer. So what happens is that when I have foo point, when I get into the situation with my code where I say like foo equals bar, underneath the allocator is going to recognize, ah, oh, okay, that's over there, that's over there. I better take that pointer and record it into this remembered set so that we can remember this region can, re th those guys can remember that, okay, that's my GC root. So when I go to find my GC root, instead of scanning all of heap, I just go into the remembered set and basically get them out of there. Um, okay, so that's really cool, but if you think about it, right? Okay, so I got all these regions over here, and I now have a space complexity issue because if I'm re if I put all this stuff in like into a regular data structure, it's going to be a very 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 sparse data structure. The remembered sets are, um, so we say a sparse implementation. Well, an implementation of a sparse data uh, data set, right? So you, it's really comp compacted, and they're very expensive to update. So we don't actually want to give all of the work to the update to the mutator threads because that will slow them down. So instead, um, uh, what we're actually going to do is we're going to introduce something else um, called an R set refinement queue with R set refinement threads. And as you can see, there's uh, quadrants in the R set refinement queue. Uh, so as the mutator threads mutate, and they recognize that, okay, this is a pointer that I need to record, then what's going to happen is that they're just going to enqueue the work into the R set refinement queue, and the, the R set refinement threads are actually going to finish the job of maintaining the R sets. And there's different quadrants, and the more full this thing gets it, or the higher rates of muta mutations that you have, what's going to happen is that we're going to get more aggressive to clean out this uh, R set refinement queue, because before we can start a garbage collection, this thing has to be empty. So if we trigger a garbage collection when there's stuff in here, the garbage collector threads are going to be responsible for emptying it out. Okay? And we don't really want that work to exceed more than 10% of the pause time goal. Remember that 200 milliseconds we mentioned at the beginning that I said I didn't know what it was for? Well, this actually is one of the things that it will try to do. So it'll try to balance the workload so that it's only at 10%. Okay. Now, um, so that other space that I was talking about is actually tenured. Okay. Um, so we have young generational space here, and we have a survivor space here, and we have a tenured region over here. So what happens is that the data will be allocated here, we move to here. And then on each collection, it'll move back and forth between the um, survivor regions. So if you actually look at what happens here, this survivor region will bounce around as we you know, empty these regions and copy them into new regions. 
And then what happens is we'll hit a tenuring threshold. So we'll copy it back and forth here so many times, you know, maximally 15. Um, of course, it all depends on a number of different things, but maximally 15. And then after that, we're going to copy the data up into these things known as uh, tenured regions. Okay? And when we fill up enough of these tenured regions, we'll hit this thing called an initiating heap occupancy percentage, otherwise known as IHOP, um, which is, well, it doesn't really matter. It's like 45%, but, you know, uh, uh, a detail you can look up later easily. Uh, you know, the point is that when we hit that threshold, we're going to start a concurrent mark in the tenured space. And what the concurrent mark is going to do is it's going to calculate who's live and the occupancy percentage of each of the regions in tenured space. Now, these are the different phases. Um, you know, to know what's going on here, it's like, you know, the red ones are stop the world, the green ones run concurrently with your application. So the, it will start with an initial mark, which will be piggybacked onto a young generational collection. And then it will do stuff like uh, r uh, scan for roots and marking. And then it'll do a remark. And the remark uh, will try to take into account the differences between when we start it and when the remark happens, you know, because your application is running concurrently with the garbage collector at that point. So obviously the world is going to change. And so we're going to try to pick up the, uh, uh, the change. And at the end, we're going to do some cleanup and resets. Okay? So as you notice, that's just a mark. There's no sweep. So how do we sweep these regions? Well, then we get back to how do we build a CSET? So after we do the initial, after the reset, um, the first young generational collection will become what's known as a mixed collection in that we're going to put into the collection set all of the um, young generational regions and some of the tenured regions. So this is basically how it works, right? So we've calculated the liveliness of each of the regions like green being live, black being not live. And I'm going to take those regions and I'm going to sort them by liveliness. And then, as you can see, some are empty after I've marked. So those are cool. During the cleanup phase, I can just put them directly back onto the free list and we're done. And then I have this threshold percent on the right that's at 85% and basically says, if the live occupancy in the region is greater than that threshold, don't bother trying to sweep these things. They're going to be too expensive. Everything in between will be swept. Well, most of the time. Okay, there's some edge cases where it's not going to happen, but, you know, that's it. Okay, so we're left with these number of eligible regions. So what we're going to do is we're going to break them up into groups. And how we break them up is, go again, going to be dependent upon the pause time goal. So I'm going to calculate how expensive, time expensive it is to um, collect a region. And I'm going to see if I can fit that into my C set and still come in under my time budget. Okay? And ideally, we're going to consume all eight mixed collections. That doesn't always happen. But that's the ideal con uh, condition. Um, it's never going to go more than eight, uh, but it can go less than eight. And so sometimes to rebalance, what I want to do is I want to force it to al somehow always be eight uh, for, for various reasons. Well, I mean, the obvious reason is that if you divide the work up, then each collection is going to do only do a little bit. If you give all of the work to a single collection, then, of course, it's going to do a lot of work or a lot more work. And, of course, that's going to have an effect on the pause time. Okay. Um, so there's some things there, some parameters there that manage that. Now, if you want to know what the whole heap actually really looks like, with everything in here, this is it. Now, contrary to every other G1 discussion you might see, where they have all these fancy diagrams, um, this was actually drawn by an application that I have on GitHub on data that was collected from a live application. 
So this is what the heap actually really looks like. Okay, so we've tenured in the top, and we have young at the bottom. And I didn't mark in this particular slide, but we have another area in the middle, which is reserve space. And each of those spaces actually serve uh, some purpose. Now, the only thing I haven't talked about are the red and the coral bits, right? So the red and the coral bits are to, to cover this case, which we call humongous allocations. So what is a humongous allocation? Well, if we have a region that's one meg, and we try to allocate something that's two megs, what's going to happen? That's a buffer overrun, right? So we don't like buffer overruns because they generally cause bad things. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab a number of regions, contiguous regions, that are going to be large, you know, that are going to create a space that's large enough to satisfy that allocation, and then we're going to allocate into that, you know, those contiguous regions, okay? And we're going to call that a humongous, alloc a humongous allocation, and we're going to treat that special because these things tend to be fairly expensive, okay? Um, and that, you know, so here you can see a number of different uh, humongous allocations that have occurred, and we can guess by experience that the one at the top is a cache, and the other ones around there are transient. More than likely, these are JSON uh, serializations. That's, the that's what's causing them, right? Now, the reason why we're worried about that is that if we don't have a space that's big enough uh, and we can't, within a few mixed collections, get a space that's big enough to satisfy the allocation, then we're going to actually call a full GC. Full GC is single-threaded, and it's going to collect the entire heap, single-threaded, uh, which you can spell that as H-U-R-T, because that's what it's going to do to you. It's going to hurt. <laughs> okay? So generally something to, to, to be avoided. Now, the, the allocators will dip into reserve space to try to prevent this from happening. So they'll allocate into reserve space uh, until they can see if the situation is going to clear up or is if it doesn't, you know, you're basically into full GC land. Okay? Um, so I think that pretty much covers... Oh, there's my reserve space in there. Um, that's sort of uh, stuck in the middle. Uh, so by default, reserve is about 10% of everything. So... Cool. Any questions so far? Because that's a really basic intro into how this thing actually works. So, um, so you know, so what are the problems that we face uh, um, when we're um, uh, using this collector? Um, well, the first one I would say is, and it's a hard one to cope with, is going to be the humongous allocations. In that case, we generally go into the application to see if we can quell or calm down uh, that behavior in the application anyway, right? And if that involves caching um, these buffers so that we can reuse the buffers, um, then that's what we're going to do. But, um, but generally, that's going to be the, uh, uh, the solution to uh, dealing with the f uh, any problems you might end up with uh, humongous allocations. Most of the time, it's going to work. In 7, it sucked. You got really bad uh, responses with humongous allocations. In 8, it starts sucking less, <laughs> right? In 9, I'm not sure yet, uh, but I know that they've done a lot of work in 9 because they recognize this is a real issue. So they're trying different tactics and different techniques to see if they can basically eliminate the issues uh, that are occurring from uh, humongous allocations. Okay. Okay, so if you want to know what makes a garbage collector pause, you need to know what it's doing. If you want to know what it's doing, you need to look at a GC log. Yes? So um, that's what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at a GC log. And for this, I'm sorry to say, I need to bring out my spectacles. Okay, so let's go here, and I'm going to start up, uh, okay, I'll do it from here. 
Hopefully the build works. Yes. Cool. It works. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna slide this out over here. And why is my so low on the screen? Okay, I'll put it at the top, and then I'll make this bigger by doing this. And how's that? Okay, we're down. Okay, that should be. Oh well, well mostly okay. So let me try to figure out if I can. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go for GC log here. Um, I'm gonna randomly choose one. Let's see, see if I can find one that's interesting. Uh, I'm actually, let me do that over here. Cause it'll be easier for me to find one that's interesting if I can actually get a good look at it. But up, 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 um, I, and I had literally have um, thousands of them, so sometimes finding an easy one, e e an interesting one, is is not as easy as you might think. Okay, so here we are. So I'm going to load a GC log tool. So this is some tooling that um, our tooling company in um, London actually um, built to help us analyze uh, GC log. So we build what I would call next-gen performance diagnostic tooling, monitoring tooling. And so, okay, so I'm basically a little bit out here, so I need to come in. Um, hopefully you guys in the back can see what's going on here. So um, so generally, we don't like charts. So if there's anything I can figure out without having to read a chart, that's really awesome. Because if I look at a chart, I have to think. And I really don't like thinking. Um, so, so we have like um, a whole bunch of things in here that are basically going to help us find things. Like here's our heap two small indicators. So basically, what we're looking for are failure conditions in the log. That And these are failure conditions because I, I basically have run out of memory. Either I've globally run out of memory, or, I've, or there's some component inside the Java heap has, has run out of memory. And here we see we have like 26 two space overflow events. So that generally means that my young generational space has gotten too small. And that's a common problem. So one of the things that we tend to do is say, don't shrink. This, this collector is highly adaptive. And it will adapt to be as small as it possibly can, because that's how you control pause times. But the problem is we're into the pay me now, pay me later scenario, where you're going to start accumulating work and tenured. And when you go to pay that bill, it it's going to hurt. I've I see some people shaking their heads and they're going like, yeah. So how do you stop that? Well, don't let young shrink as much. So your, your individual pause times are going to be probably a bit longer, not that much hopefully, but a bit longer. But you're going to avoid the situation where down the road you're going to get that one pause that's going to just blow you out of the water. Okay? So that's, that's, that's one thing that we actually do in here. So, um, so we can see that in here. There's some other things in here that we've noticed. Uh, so we have another issue here. And this is where, this is sort of like what I call the, you know, you've maybe you've heard the expression canary in the cold mine. Do you know what this means? Do you have a translation of it? Yeah. Right. Okay. So 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 here we were looking at uh, high kernel times. And you're going like, okay, well, why do I care? Well, that probably means you have either a misconfigured uh, Linux kernel or Windows kernel or whatever type of kernel you're using. And or you have very noisy neighbors that are interfering with your application's performance. Okay? Now, here's where it gets important. Uh, because... Um, you know, you might, uh, so, well, okay, it's on the principle that whatever bugs um, the garbage collector is going to probably equally bug everything else. However, whatever pauses your application, who gets blamed? The garbage collector. And this is times when the garbage collector will pause your application for a long time, but it's not its fault. It's something outside of the JVM. So the importance of recognizing this is that you can say, ah, this is not because of the garbage collector. And because it's not because of the garbage collector, I can start looking for the other things that cause my system to pause. Right? So once you basically take the blame off the garbage collector, then a whole new world opens up for you, which is really, really nice. Okay? 
So and 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 if I look, if you, it's so you can look at this and say, okay, yeah, um, let's look at the chart. And this is why we prefer the analytics. So if we go down here to the chart that everyone loves, uh, CPU summary. Of course, in here you can actually see the high kernel times, right? So the red, sort of pinkish color, should be red, is kernel times. Um, the user time is in green and the CPU time uh, is in black, right? And so you can see, ah, the green is much higher than the black, and, um, and that's a good situation because um, that means you're getting good parallelism in the algorithm. If the green and black are equal, then you're getting crappy parallelism in the algorithm, and that also could be a sign of, of, of some, you know, some other problems that you could run into. Um, and and, and, and so, and we've actually had indications where the, 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 the kernel times were actually greater than the, um, than, than, than the CPU times, right? Or the, or other times were completely inverted. And you're going to look at those situations and say, not the garbage collector ca causing this problem. It's outside interference, okay? So you can do stuff like that. So, uh, so this stuff is interesting for doing, for getting it. But you know, that's not really telling me what the garbage collector is doing. If you want to know what the garbage collector is doing, well, let's 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 look at the standard views first, right? Um, so this has been running for two days. We got a summary screen, so you can read the summary screen. It's got you know a whole bunch of statistics that people want in the tooling, but I couldn't really care less about. So I'm not really interested. But people want them, so they're there. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the, the more interesting f thing is like, okay, so this is a G1. I want to look at the mixed collection counts. And you can see in this case, um, I don't have any mixed collections of length 8. So, so, so I'm going to go, um, actually, let's try uh, uh, this view here. And maybe you can see. Um, uh, can I see? Yeah, it's hard because of this blurriness going on here, but let's, okay, let's just pick on this area here. Um, so you can see, uh, yeah, if I can't see it up here, that means you guys are pretty much screwed, aren't you? Uh, but on a real screen, <laughs> you can actually see these things. What happens is that, um, so basically you'll have like uh, an initial mark which is uh, target black, so that's this initial mark, and then, and then you'll have a remark, which is green, should be, or sorry, that's the cleanup, and then after the cleanup phases, you're going to see here we have one, two, three mixed collections, right? So, so if you go back, we can see that. Um, Boom. So we had a run of three mixed collections 47 times, right? Remember I said the target is eight, and I'd like to hit eight. So this thing is skewed this way. I'd really like it to be skewed that way. So in this case, I'd probably go in and try to do some tuning to see if I can get the collector to balance out the mixed collections so that I'm always having runs of eight as opposed to just runs of one, two, or three, or four. Okay, so that's that's one thing that you'd actually wa uh, want to do, um, and then the other thing is like if we look at the phases within the young generational collection, um, we can see that there's this blue stuff and there's this stuff we can't really see. So the blue stuff are the parallel phases, and hopefully the parallel phases dominate. So when I go into this view, you can see that yep, parallel phases dominate except for these two points in time when I'm not sure what's going on. So it looks like the application is extra busy at that point in time. But until then, the parallel phases really, 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 really dominate. And then the other phases sort of dominate, uh, or, you know, they become more prominent in, the, in this era, in, in, in this time frame. Um, so what I can do is say, le well, let's see what the parallel phases look like. And remember I said object copy should dominate? Well. Here, we can see object copy is actually dominating the parallel phase. And that's pretty much what we want it. And the next thing that we can see here 
is that our set refinement is still maybe a bit too expensive. So maybe there's some work we can do to try to reduce the uh, amount of work left over for the garbage collector uh, to reduce that value there. It's not too bad, but it's still above the 10% threshold. Okay? Now, other phases I said was somewhat dominant uh, when or, you know, was high at other times. And so let's take a look and see what the other phases are. And that's the yellow bit. And uh, these yellow bits are is actually reference processing. You know the weak, final, soft, phantom references that need special processing? Well, in this case, you can see reference processing is the dominant cost in the other phases. So we can make one want to make sure that we have parallel reference processing turned on, which is not turned on by default. And there's a reason for that, which is kind of dumb. Um, and if we want to actually see what's going on, we can print the reference processing. And we can see that um, in this case, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's a little more, it's, it's more difficult to see because of the quality of the screen. But if you look at this, what you're going to see is that it's actually um, uh, final references that are the dominating cost. And if you look at uh, the final reference costs in, st in this particular model here and counts, you can see that we're processing um, at times upward to uh, 100 to 200,000 final references per second, you know? So, or, well, per GC cycle, actually not per second. Um, so with the tooling, you can actually get a good idea what's going on. You can try to adjust the uh, parameters on the collector um, so that eventually the dominating cost will be object copy. And when you get to that point, you're screwed. <laughs> There's nothing you can seemingly do about object copy costs, right? Uh, there's nothing to be done here. Now, I say nothing seemingly to be done, but that's, of course, not quite true. So what we can actually do, if we go back to the slides, is we can come back and look at the weak generation hypothesis. So this is what it looks like, the yellow line, right? So basically, so you can see occupancy or volume of reachable, you know, you know the occupancy is... Um, how much data we have, and we have an age. And you can see over time, as data grows old, it basically is retired and collected. Um, now, there's a consequence of the weak generational hypothesis that the original authors um, might have realized, but you know they didn't really look for. And this is a really interesting thing, right? Um, since every application has s you know, a curve that looks like this, they'll be different for each application, but they'll be yeah, just about. Uh, generally looking like this. Um, we can just do some calculus here, right? Does anyone know what the integral of this curve is? Well, generally it's the volume, right? It's a volumetric, right? And so what it's basically saying is that the volume of data, live data, for any application should be constant for some variable definition of constant, okay? So it actually fluctuates over time, naturally, but in the long run, it's a constant volume. And it has to be. Or your heap would be unstable and you'd run out of memory. Right? Okay. So, um, so we can use that information. This is like really cool information. Um, what it basically says, right? So we'll go back to the whole premise at the beginning. Remember the cost model? I said the cost model was... Uh, dominated by object copy, okay? Object copy of live data, which means that under ideal conditions, our garbage collection pause times should be the same all the time, okay? They're not because of the fluctuations in volumes, but generally they're about the same, which basically means that it doesn't matter what volume of data I have in memory, my pause time is dominated by live, not by dead, therefore, um, I can have as much live or like data in heap when I go to collect, I'm going to have approximately the same amount of live data, which means my pause time isn't affected by the amount of data in heap, which means I can have larger and larger and larger young generational spaces 
And because I have larger and larger young generational spaces, at a fixed allocation rate, what's going to happen is that uh, my GC frequency is going to decrease. And so my overall, my object copy times will decrease because I'll be copying less frequently with no additional cost. Does that make sense? Okay, so I can actually control um, object copy costs by decreasing the frequency by increasing the size of Young and not letting it shrink. So that's one of the things that we can actually, we figure out to do. And, and there's a lot of other things that, you know, I could talk about here, but, you know, th in this short talk, it's very difficult. And, and plus, there's a lot of things that we simply don't know yet. This is a new collector. We're still trying to figure it out. And as we figure it out, they change parts of the implementation, which means that what we figured out no longer applies. <laughs> so we have to start over again, okay? Or, you know, or we're less, uh, we're, we're, we're not as close to the, uh, um, you know, what we figured out is not quite as valid as it used to be, or it doesn't work as well. Um, so anyways, um, if you want to learn more about performance tuning, I do offer a workshop. And um, if you're interested in our tooling and Sensum and other th the other types of tooling, then um, you can visit our website, jclarity.com, uh, and you can see um, the I, I what I think is what I would call like the next gen of uh, performance uh, tooling. Um, yeah. So, um, any questions? You don't. <laughs> okay. I guess that means no.